Thinking about it, thinking about it. We had super it slow. It's live now. Pardon? It says it's live on Facebook. Oh, we good? We good. All right. Good morning, Carolyn. Good I'll morning. Act, good morning. I'll act like we haven't been chatting for the last 15 minutes. We have, but <laughs> it's so nice to see you again. Me too. Me too. All right. So um, tax laws, like the fun ones that I'm always like, like I don't do taxes. I, I got a 42% in my tax class. It was still an A, but it was a 42%. I'm like, I'm never doing taxes. <laughs> yeah, the tax, tax law, you know, you have the law and then you have all the courts rules and regulations that kind of add to the law and just kind of increases the fun. Yeah, yeah. So tell me how you got involved specifically in taxes because like tax is your baby, right? It is my baby. Yeah, and it's, it's a little bit weird. I loved it since high school. I, I had a, an accounting class and my accounting teacher was like, you know, if you bring in your, 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 uh, your forms when you first get your first job and I'll help you get a maximum refund. And I'm like, yes, you show me, show me the forms. And then I worked at HR and Block in college. And, and when I left college, I knew I just wanted to do tax. And my first job was a corporate income tax auditor for the state of New York. I was working in Chicago. At, they have 50 people at their Chicago office. And my 23-year-old self would go into different corporations with my rolling suitcase and say, I need to see your, your papers. And oh, that's a gray area, but that's not New York's position. So it got really interesting to see all the gray areas. And, and um, I realized that the gray areas are the areas of opportunity. It's not black and white in the tax law. And, and that's what you, what gets the court and, and uh, you get to see what's in the court's rule if it's allowed or, or disallowed. And, and so one of the things I like to do in my current job uh, is look at the court cases and then apply what's been, what's been ruled to my current clients and, and help them realize what's possible in their business. You know, that is one thing I have never, ever, I've talked to a lot of tax people and CPAs in my life, and I've never heard somebody say like, yeah, let's dig into the court cases and see how we can get more money for you. Like, holy cow, what a niche. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to let you dive right in because I can't wait okay. to learn what you have for us today. Sure. Sure. I, I'll go ahead and screen share. Okay, so I'm Carolyn Smith. I'm a CPA. I'm the owner of my tax coaching, and I'm a certified tax coach. And uh, basically, that means instead of uh, tax preparation, is looking at what happened last year. Okay, I'll I'll put in all all the boxes of everything that happened last year. What a certified tax coach does is where are you now? Where are your goals? How are you currently spending money outside of your business? And how can we maybe change a couple things so that that how you're already spending money can be a business deduction? So, so I've been, I've gone, I've taken much more training than needed to get a CPA. I just to dive in and and really become an expert. So, what I help clients do is more like a mindset shift. It's the so the left and right side of this of this frame, you earn the same amount of money. You know, whatever that is. So you earn your money and on the left side, you pay taxes first and then you spend and save it on what's left. On the right side, you earn the same amount, but I look out at ways to save and spend first and then you pay taxes on what's left. So uh, today we're going to talk about how to hire your kids and have it be a tax deduction for you. Uh, now the court cases, going back to the court cases, uh, they have ruled that that a child of the employer, I'm sorry, a child of the owner, as young as seven, it's okay for them to, to work in the business. Now, that's not to say that a five-year-old can't work in the business. It just hasn't been tested by the courts yet. So if you have a job that your five-year-old can do, and uh, I would say go for it, even though the, the courts haven't tested it. If, if you have everything to back it up, I, my, my approach is go for it. 
So uh, now the, the job has to be ordinary and necessary for the business. So you couldn't, for example, me as an accountant, I couldn't hire a kid to play video games because I don't need video games in my accounting business. Uh, but if I, but shredding, yeah, I do have that need. So, so ordinary and necessary for the business. Uh, and you need to make it as explicit as possible in an employment contract. So you need to write out what is the kid expected to do when, how many hours per week. And even you need to put on there that you expect a time card for, for the, the boss, which is you to review. And, and as many details as possible is, is really important for, for hiring your kid. Um, and you need to, uh, you need, anytime you have an employee, there's, there's documents that require onboarding. So as an accountant, I might have a document that says you can't take client's information and share it. It, it needs to be stayed in, in the business. And, and I would I would have my kid sign that, yes, I'm not gonna take any of the client's information outside of the business. Um, but also like the, the payroll documents, like the W-4, anything that you have your normal employees fill out, you need to have your child fill out. Go ahead and make sure you have a copy of their social security card, like, like the forms tell you you need. Um, and you need to pay attention to the state and, and federal laws. Okay, so there's child labor laws and then there's employment laws. And child labor, if it's your own kid, you don't have to pay attention to your to the age. Uh, so I could hire my seven-year-old. I could not hire my seven-year-old niece. Uh, so the laws are different for that. Uh, so, but for your own kid, they it, it is allowed. Um, so the job can't be dangerous and it, and it has to be under the, the maximum that that's allowed for for children to work but other than that it's it's not a problem for for kids to work in your business so Make Shana's, sure sorry so sean is asking can um do you draft up these contracts on your own yep okay yep the, the employment contract you can you can you put it in like children's understanding language <laughs> like you're going to be shredding documents writing your paper. right you are yep. going to be yep. putting leaflets on people's doors or you're going to be licking stamps oh people don't lick stamps anymore that's right that's right uh stamping envelopes perhaps there you go uh, and then a time card so whatever system you have if it's paper or or computer you need to have the date the time in time out number of hours worked and and you need to keep that those time cards of your children with the same in the same spot as the time cards are, as everyone else, um, and it this might sound funny, but it actually has to be real wages, real money deposited into a bank account, uh, not pizza parties. Uh, someone actually tried to do pizza parties, and the courts didn't allow it. So so uh, it needs to be real money in an, in an account. Uh, so if your child is a real employee, they'll get a W two. And if they earn more than 12,400, they'll have to file a tax return. If they earn less than 12,400, they don't have to. It's, that's part of the IRS rules is, is if your only income is less than 12,400, you don't have to file a tax return. Uh, so, so there's a couple benefits of hiring your kids. Um, so, so the money can either be deposited into a Roth IRA account. You can start helping them save for retirement at a really early age, or you could deposit it into a 529 plan and you could save for help the kids save for college or a custodial account. And any expense the, the kid has, such as soccer cleats or, or a um, private tuition, you can have the kid pay for his own tuition from the the money that he works uh, at, from the money he earns at, at the job that he works for you. So uh, it's kind of a reverse way to say, uh, this is how you can deduct your kid's soccer plates, is by having your kid work for you. Um, 
And then the tech, uh, so for the business, you, you get a tax deduction for anything that you pay for the child. And then um, if the kid is under the age of 18, the, there's no employee or employer taxes on the social security and Medicare. Um, so so that's, that's across the board. And then uh, most states, if the child is under 21, there's no unemployment taxes. So there is, there is a lot of savings there too. Um, but a, a big piece of, of um, one of the benefits is instead of having your kid uh, or instead of paying tax on all of the money that you make, you can shift, I guess, shift some of the income to some of your kids. They pay their portion. And even if it's more than 12400 the way the tax laws are now, they only pay 10%. Their 10% is much less than your probably 30 to 35%. So so in the end, you're, you're uh, showing less income for the business and paying le less tax. Oh, uh, so okay, you've got an example. You got it coming. Yep. So if you say, I want my kids to work four hours a week, I'm going to pay you $8 an hour, and that's $1,500 for the year. Uh, basically, how it net, nets out in taxes is that your taxes will be reduced by $500 because you pay your kids $1,500 for the year. Uh, that's assuming a 33% tax bracket. So how reasonable does the hourly rate need to be for your kids? So expensive kids, right? Marching band, show choir, dance, all those things. Like it's sure. expensive to raise a kid these days. Can I say, Nora, I'm going to pay you $25 an hour to do whatever it is on this list that I am hiring you to do. And it's going into a custodial account and we're going to pay for all of your dance, all of your marching band requirements, all of your costumes out of this account. But I'll let you keep $8 an hour. Is that kosher? Yeah. No, no. Oh. <laughs> so you you would pay your kid what's market value. So what what would you pay someone to shred your papers? Uh, what would you pay someone to mow your lawn? What would you pay someone to do all the marketing for you? So if we'll say you have a seventeen year old, they're a computer whiz. They do all your marketing. They can do your website uh, development and. Normally, that kind of thing will say you pay, I don't know, $1,000 a month. Sure, you can, you can put, I'm going to pay you $1,000 a month because that's the market value. For a seven-year-old, I can't imagine there would be much, many jobs that would be worth $1,000 a month. But, but um, if you look at how much you might pay an admin assistant to do the same thing, maybe $12 an hour, sure. So, so it needs to be document. Sense. Market demand. And document, document, document. Definitely. Right. Definitely. Okay. See, the market does demand because on Task Rabbit, it's going to cost me so this much to have somebody come do it. That's right. Okay. That's right. All right. So, um, so here's a, a couple of examples you can have for the smaller kids shredding, stuffing envelopes, and, and putting a stamp on the envelopes. Maybe some, some uh, data entry in Excel. Um, maybe some cleaning or organizing. When I was when I was a kid, I would go to my mom's work and she would hand me a stack of papers in, in the filing cabinet and ask me to alphabetize. And I would put, I would, I would do that. So, um, I mean, my mom didn't hire me. I was just her little helper for the day. But if you hired your kid to do that, that would be a, a, a deduction for you. Uh, I would probably wouldn't trust my, my seven-year-old to hire, to handle all the customer service calls, but 16, sure. And even 25, if you have a, a kid that's kind of out of college and needs a summer job and is capable, it, they're probably in a, in a uh, lower income tax bracket than, than you. And so, so it's, it's, it's a win-win. They get the money, you get, you get the job done, and uh, they get to pay taxes on that money instead of you. Um, but so if you have someone with a license, you can have them maybe run errands for you, or um, if you had a property development company, maybe go retrieve the, the rent checks 
deposit them in the bank, maybe drive by a couple times a week and take a picture of the front just to make sure it's it's uh, pretty and, and then send it send it to, to you as, as the owner. Um, lawn maintenance. So all of those things like, oh yeah, my kids could do that. Put it in the job description. It's, it's no problem. Is there an uh, upper age limit? Or I, am I not giving us yeah. away? No, no, not at all. Is there all. an upper not age all. limit? Like my no. kids, my kids 30 years old, I've and still get the tax benefit of no um, social security uh, unemployment, that type of thing. So the social security and, uh, let me go back to that slide. Um, the social security, Medicare, there's, there's no social security, Medicare up to age 18. And okay. the unemployment, the, the no unemployment goes up to age 21. Um, but I mean, even if your kid is 30, you could still hire them. Uh, and uh, you could hire them probably at a, at a higher wage and they, you could tack on more to the job description. So uh, there, I would say there's less benefits such as the uh, these tax situations that I just highlighted. But on your end, as the employer, you still get the deduction for whatever you pay them. Awesome. So that's kind of the um, hiring your kids side. And, and um, I wanted to make sure to go a little bit deep in, just in case there was someone who went to implement that today. I, I, I gave you enough to kind of get going. Uh, but I also, as I was going, I wanted to just share one more kind of fun tax tip that I, I like to share with my clients. I love helping my clients deduct their vacation, their personal vacations as business, business deduction. Now the IRS has, uh, has detailed what's allowable and not allowable. So anytime you travel, um, a travel day is considered a business day. And then uh, let's say, well, you need to have some sort of, of pre-planned business activity. It could be a meeting or an appointment. Um, it doesn't have to be long, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour, maybe a lunch. Uh, so if you have one of those on Friday and one of those on Monday, essentially what you could do is leave on Thursday with your family and then all day Friday, all day Saturday and all day Sunday, all day Monday and all day Tuesday, all of that would be a business expense if, if you had the uh, an, an appointment on Friday as well as Monday. The weekend in between is considered business if you have uh, business on Friday and Monday. Um, so that would look like a flight, rental car, hotel. If you needed to dress up for, for your meeting and and needed to have your whatever you're wearing dry clean while you're away, that's not a problem. Your dry cleaning would be deductible and then half of your meals. And, and that's, that would be like for your whole family, that would be deductible. Wow, like, okay, when you say all flights, you mean everybody's ticket? Sorry, sorry. Okay. Just, just your flight. Just but your the flight. meals, 150% of all of the meals. 50%. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you get to feed your family. You get to feed your family. Uh, they get to ride in your rental car. They get to stay in your hotel. Now, if you have a lot of kids and you maybe need two hotel rooms, you would probably only be able to deduct one, but it's, it's a good deal. Yeah. Holy buckets. Okay. All right. So that's why I see people on Facebook like, hey, I'm heading to Denver. Who do I know that I should meet? Let's have coffee while I'm in Denver. Okay, yeah, let's have coffee while we're in Denver. Oh my gosh. Okay, um, so documentation with this. When you say like it's pre-planned, do you expect your clients to send you like an email or how do, you, they, how do they document? I don't want to see it. I, that's not how I work. The IRS will definitely want to see it. So okay. if you were ever audited, they, wanted to, they will, they will want to see the email confirmation of, of the... Uh, the meeting before the day that your flight takes off. Okay. For every day. So it's not like I can land like, oh shoot, I'm here. I have a meeting on Friday. I don't have one on Monday. You need to have that before you leave. Before. And it's, 
and you can't if you're driving along and you see a conference advertised on billboard and like oh i can go go to that not that, not if you're already there you can't do that okay all right okay all right so I have a ton of other questions that are unrelated, but I think yes. this stuff so far is super good. Um, so I had a question about, can I, I'm an S corp, it feels restrictive. Can I go back to an LLC? Like, I don't know. Um, an LLC is a legal designation. It means limited liability company, and but it's not a tax designation. So you can be a sole proprietorship, a partnership, an S corporation or a C corporation as a LLC. Um, Maybe the question is, can I go back to sole proprietor? Um, and yes, it, there's there are a few forms to fill out. So basically, you would have to revoke your S election, and um, and so yes, it is possible. But yeah, I can't. It's I can't really. Most of the time, S corporations are better than than a sole proprietorship from a tax perspective. Um, but I guess it's a, it's a case by case basis for sure. But the short answer is yes, it is allowed. Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop. Do you have anything else in your slides? Otherwise I'm gonna keep this conversation going without your, okay. Sure. Uh, talk to me about this Augusta loophole I keep hearing about. Oh, okay. Um, so if you can rent out your personal home for up to 14 days, uh, and and you don't you don't the on the personal side you won't have to pay any taxes, and on the business side you would have the deduction because you're renting it out. Uh, so so let's say let's say you had a meet and greet of of your your clients, and you said come to my home, and you had this big party for your clients, and if you had a similar party at a, we'll say at a hotel, the hotel would charge you a room fee and you can charge the business something similar. You can charge a, a room fee or a rental and the business will pay whatever, $2,000 for the space rental. And if, if you do that less than 14 days in a year, you don't have to claim anything on your personal return. Does it have to be a big shindig? No, no. I mean, if it could be, uh, if you're if you have an office space and you meet clients and uh, if you if normally you would pay for any sort of rental um, mm. elsewhere then then yeah you can do that okay so that's kind of the criteria like if I would pay somebody else for this use of this space mm -hmm. that's when you can count it as one of the fourteen days right right um, so if I so I personally work out of my home and but I do have the option to uh, rent an office somewhere for $200 an hour um, and so if I say actually I want to meet, have my client meet here and you will say my living room as the meeting space I could I could um, pay myself $200 an hour for for that space okay do you do it more by the day or by the hour it's up to you okay. it, it's okay. whatever the market demand okay whatever the dark market demands that's that's that gray area <laughs> that you're it's, gray, gray, yeah. it's foggy it's gray it's smoky it's smoky um the da, 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 we talked about vacations buying a car sometimes people use uh i see leases on their business expenses a lot or sometimes they just use mileage sometimes they are buying a car through for the business um and sometimes i hear a lot of Hey, I'm, I I uh, I need a tax deduction. This is especially in farming communities. I need a tax deduction, so I went and I bought a truck. Well, you just bought an eighty thousand dollar truck to get a twenty thousand dollar benefit. Right. <laughs> now you still have to pay sixty thousand dollars. So when is it better to to use all of the bits and pieces of maintaining your car versus just straight up mileage? That's a case by case basis. So it kind of depends on your the gas mileage that you get on your car. It depends on how often you drive. Uh, if someone has a brand new car, I like I do both comparisons one uh, together. Now, if you've already done, we'll say the bits and pieces part, so you take 
you you will add up all your gas receipts and all of your car wash receipts and and everything that you spend on your car for a year and you use your car for 20 percent it um by the way depreciation is also part of that um if you do that the bits and pieces piece um one year you have to continue doing it for the life of the car because of the depreciation piece so you can go you can switch from miles to to itemize um in, in the same car but you can't switch from itemize to miles once you choose itemize for a car you have to keep with it so if i'm using my old beater car it's probably just going to be better to do miles because there's nothing to depreciate right yeah okay all right Okay, vacations, legal versus tax. We've got the Augusta loophole, buying a car. Um, oh, when you were starting, you were saying saying the mindset of spend what's left. Can we actually go back to that first slide? Yeah. Because this is what I find interesting. Yeah. So people are like, we'll spend what's left after we pay taxes. But what I'm coming across is that people, uh, they spend it and then they're like, oh crap, I have taxes. Right. This right here. Yeah, yeah. Save and spend on what's left. So they earn, they pay taxes. Sometimes the, it, sometimes those two are switched around. They earn, they right. save and spend, and then they try to pay taxes. Um, what are some nifty tools for people to not get into that? Like even a farther left-hand graphic where it would be earn, spend, try to pay taxes, oh crap. <laughs> right. So. Um... I mean, what you do in, in helping with, with cash flow, that's that's a big piece. And so kind of looking at what tax bracket are you going to be in? And uh, so if you're a sole proprietor, you know you'll have the 15.3% on any of the net income you have on addition, in addition to your your other income tax. So you have the, the um, self-employment tax and the income tax. Um, so it, I guess a good rule of thumb is is to keep to shelter 30 percent first uh, and then and then um pay quarterly so that so that you don't have such a big big amount due at the end of the year um but if you go 2019 going into 2020 has been actually really hard for business owners 2019 has been a great year 2020 has not and and now it's Time to pay taxes, and they don't have the money. Their they, their income for 2020 just hasn't been where it had, was in 2019, and um, and I actually help on that piece too. So so I have a tax resolution piece to my business where basically if you are owing the IRS more than ten thousand dollars, I can help you either work out a deal with the IRS or maybe even. Uh, minimally i can get rid of your interest and get rid of your penalties and and i can um stru help structure so that you have payments that you can afford um but, so that's just i guess a sh shameless plug but no uh, please on, <laughs> people need to know end, this service exists on the front end just um looking at at how much you imagine to have at the at the end of the year and whatever it is put 30 percent in the bank account specifically for I like it. Okay, so far as asking, um, she's an interior designer. She's really good. Um, so if I'm updating my home office, can I write that off? And yes, it's in my house. Yes, definitely. So uh, there are similar to the to the vehicle. There are two options. You have the the uh, for the vehicle. You have total miles. You can take at it. We'll say fifty cents a mile, or the itemized. And it's kind of similar for the home. You can take $5 per square foot of your office area, or you can take a percentage. So that would be your um, office area uh, square footage divided by the total square footage of your home. We'll say that's 15%. Um, then you look at all of your, depending if you own a rent, if you rent, it would be your rent and if you own it would be your property taxes and the interest on your home uh, but then you would add on the utilities your internet um, if you if you um, 
hire a lawn maintenance guy that can be part of the home upkeep. Um, what else? Home insurance. Housekeeper? Housekeeper, yes. Uh, so any any expense that you have to to um, upkeep your home, you can you can deduct your um, square footage percentage. Um, so all of those expenses together at fifteen percent is what you would be able to deduct. Okay. Um, how do people know if they have a good tax person? So April fifteenth. Sorry. For businesses March 15th, for individuals April 15th, it's a um, it's a really stressful time for for accountants, and they often um, the mindset is I want to finish as many many as I can and as quick as the time to do it. So, if your tax person is um, even in the midst of the busyness, taking the time to to dive in and ask, um, so. Um, man, your your expenses seem pretty low. Do you did you have any of this or this or this? Um, you you need someone to to have to share um, to ask the questions to um, to set expectations ahead of time. This is this is what you need. This is let's let's meet. Actually, let's meet at third quarter to kind of look at where your business is. Uh, if you only talk to your your tax person. At tax time, and it's it's like, and you feel that uh, they're rushing through to get yours done. Um, it it might be a good idea to look for somebody else. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, oh shoot, I had one at the top of my head, and now I, I lost it. Oh, you just that's because you just covered it. Like when do when should you be talking to your tax person? At least right. Q three. Right. Uh, so, of course, when taxes are due, but um, at the end of around third quarter, at the end of fourth quarter, um, on my end from tax planning, I can't do, I can't, I'll say, plan to take a, a vacation and write it off um, in January 2021 if I want to apply it to 2020. I have to look at what can we do this year to save? So, and, and I, so it's, it's more of a proactive approach. Um, yep. Where can people find you? Oh, I'll, I, oh, I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the internet. Um, my, my business is, is called My Tax Coaching. Um, and I have, I guess I do have one more slide. Uh, this is, this is my contact information. And uh, so, Carolyn at mytaxcoaching.com. There's my phone number, and and I'm available. I I like to tailor solutions for my clients based on what they need. I love that. I'm just gonna put your info right here. Find so under here in the comments. Find Carolyn. Find Carolyn. There it is. At my tax coaching oh last one last question for you sure people come to south dakota and wyoming because they want their business to be in south dakota or wyoming mm -hmm. how does that work it so i've never lived in those states correct me if i'm wrong they come there for the business because it's it's more business friendly they no income taxes yeah, yeah. it's 50 bucks to get your llc got it Got it. So uh, basically, you would um, for federal, everything would be the same. For state, uh, instead of paying, I live in Michigan now. I used to live in Illinois, and the tax rates were high, maybe six, six to seven percent. Um, so, so instead of paying Illinois six to seven percent on the money I made from the business. Oh, the business, all the business activity happened in South Dakota, so I wouldn't have to pay any income tax on that. Um, so, so that's that's the piece. You would save six to seven percent on the state. Okay. All right. Farah says she's got one more question. So let's see okay. so if there's a delay on Facebook. So I'm going to give her a minute about that. Um, Oh, 
okay, I have one more. Where, where are you at, Farah? One more. Um, is there, so if people are residents, mm -hmm. like there are services like Your Best Address here in Sioux Falls that does, you can come and stay in South Dakota for one night and you're a resident of South Dakota. And then you don't have to pay income taxes either. But so for like businesses that are sole proprietors, there's really no point in registering in South Dakota because all of that flows through to your personal anyway, right? Right. right. So, so is there, who sole does proprietor that? And S corporation, they and partnership, they all flow through to your your personal income tax. The C corporation is the only entity that does not. Um, and and so, uh, sorry, I lost the question. Oh, um, residency. Yeah, I mean, does it does it matter? Like, unless you're a S corp or LLC or um, C corp, does it matter that you're registered? Your business exists in a different state because it flows through anyway. Uh, well, on the state side, you would be able to allocate how much was earned in one state versus the other. Uh, okay, all right, that goes to show how much I know about states that have income tax. Um, okay, Farah is saying, so now this year I had a good year. Should I be filing independently? I didn't have much business previously, so my husband was filing taxes. I'm guessing the answer is going to be it depends. I, I think the, the question is maybe Mary filing separate versus Mary filing joint. Uh, probably, or should I continue filing with my husband? It's almost always more beneficial to do Mary filing joint. Okay. There's probably a few little things in there. It's just case by case. You got to dig in and know. Yeah. Okay. Worth asking the question to a professional Fara for sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Carolyn. This was fun. I like this. And thank you for not being boring. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. So I, I guess if anybody has any tax related questions or, or even if they want to dive into their personal business and, and figure out what's possible in their business, whether restructuring or shift income to parents or kids, I can, I, I can help with that. I love it. I love it. I love having a resource that you obviously know your stuff and you've brought up stuff that I haven't heard of my own tax guy. Fantastic. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. Have a great day.